Xing a paragraph by Edgar Allan Poe, as it is well known that the wise men came from the East, and as Mr. Touch and Go Bullet Head came from the East, it follows that Mr. Bullet Head was a wise man. And if collateral proof of the matter be needed, here we have it. Mr. B was an editor. Irascibility was his sole foible. For in fact, the obstinacy of which men accused him was anything but his foible, since he justly considered it his forte. It was his strong point, his virtue, and it would have required all the logic of a Brownson to convince him that it was anything else. I have shown that Touch and Go Bullet Head was a wise man, and the only occasion on which he did not prove infallible was when, abandoning that legitimate home for all wise men, the East, he migrated to the city of Alas under the great Onopolis, or some place of a similar title, out West. I must do him the justice to say, however, that when he made up his mind finally to settle in that town, it was under the impression that no newspaper, and consequently no editor, existed in that particular section of the country. In establishing the teapot, he expected to have the field all to himself. I feel confident he never would have dreamed of taking up his residence in Alexander the Great Onopolis, had he been aware that, in Alexander the Great Onopolis, there lived a gentleman named John Smith, if I rightly remember, who, for many years, had there quietly grown fat in editing and publishing the Alexander the Great Onopolis Gazette. It was solely, therefore, on account of having been misinformed, that Mr. Bullet had found himself in Alex. Suppose we call it Nopolis, for short but, as he did find himself there, he determined to keep up his character for obst, for firmness, and remain. So remain he did, and he did more. He unpacked his press, type, etc., etc., rented an office exactly opposite to that of the Gazette, and, on the third morning after his arrival, issued the first number of the Aliazan, that is to say, of the Nopolis Depot. As nearly as I can recollect, this was the name of the new paper. The leading article, I must admit, was brilliant, not to say severe. It was especially bitter about things in general, and as for the editor of the Gazette, he was torn all to pieces in particular. Some of Bullethead's remarks were really so fiery that I have always, since that time, been forced to look upon John Smith, who is still alive, in the light of a salamander. I cannot pretend to give all the teapot's paragraphs verbatim, but one of them runs thus. Oh, yes, oh, we perceive, oh, no doubt. The editor over the way is a genius. Oh, my, oh, goodness, gracious. What is this world coming to? Oh, tempera, oh, Moses. A Philippic at once so caustic and so classical, alighted like a bombshell among the hitherto peaceful citizens of Nopolis. Groups of excited individuals gathered at the corners of the streets. Everyone awaited, with heartfelt anxiety, the reply of the dignified Smith. Next morning it appeared, as follows. We quote from the teapot of yesterday the subjoined paragraph. Oh, yes. Oh, we perceive. Oh, no doubt. Oh, my. Oh, goodness. Oh, tempera. Oh, Moses. Why, the fellow is all low. That accounts for his reasoning in a circle and explains why there is neither beginning nor end to him, nor to anything that he says. We really do not believe the vagabond can write a word that hasn't an O in it. Wonder if this owing is a habit of his. By the by, he came away from down east in a great hurry. Wonder if he owes as much there as he does here. Oh, it is pitiful. 
the indignation of Mr. Bullethead at these scandalous insinuations, I shall not attempt to describe. On the eel-skinning principle, however, he did not seem to be so much incensed at the attack upon his integrity as one might have imagined. It was the sneer at his style that drove him to desperation. What? He? Touch and go bullet head. Not able to write a word without an O in it. He would soon let the jackanapes see that he was mistaken. Yes, he would let him see how much he was mistaken. The puppy. He? Touch and go bullet head. Of frog pondium. Would let Mr. John Smith perceive that he? Bullet head could indict, if it so pleased him, a whole paragraph I, a whole article in which that contemptible vowel should not once, not even once, make its appearance. But no, that would be yielding a point to the said John Smith. He, bullet head, would make no alteration in his style to suit the caprices of any Mr. Smith in Christendom. Perish so vile a thought, the O forever. He would persist in the O, he would be as Oui as Oui could be. Burning with the chivalry of this determination, the great touch and go, in the next teapot, came out merely with this simple but resolute paragraph, in reference to this unhappy affair. The editor of the teapot has the honor of advising the editor of the Gazette that he, the teapot, will take an opportunity, in tomorrow morning's paper, of convincing him, the Gazette, that he, the teapot, both can and will be his own master as regards style. He, the teapot, intending to show him, the Gazette, the supreme, and indeed the withering contempt with which the criticism of him, the Gazette, inspires the independent bosom of him, the teapot, by composing for the especial gratification of him, the Gazette, a leading article, of some extent, in which the beautiful vowel, the emblem of eternity, yet so offensive to the hyper-exquisite delicacy of him, the Gazette, shall most certainly not be avoided by his the Gazette's most obedient, humble servant, the teapot. So much for Buckingham, in fulfillment of the awful threat thus darkly intimated rather than decidedly enunciated, the great bullet head, turning a deaf ear to all entreaties for copy, and simply requesting his foreman to go to the DL, when he the foreman assured him the teapot that it was high time to go to press. Turning a deaf ear to everything, I say, the great bullet head sat up until daybreak, consuming the midnight toil, and absorbed in the composition of the really unparalleled paragraph, which follows. So ho, John, how now? Told you so, you know. Don't crow, another time, before you're out of the woods. Does your mother know you're out? Oh, no, no, so go home at once, now, John to your odious old woods of Concord. Go home to your woods, old Dowl. Go. You won't. Oh, Po, Po, John, don't do so. You've got to go, you know. So go at once, and don't go slow. For nobody owns you here, you know. Oh, John, John, if you don't go, you're no homo, no. You're only a foul. An owl, a cow, a sow, a doll, a pole, a poor, old, good for nothing to nobody, log, dog, hog, or frog, come out of a conquered bog. Cool, now cool, do be cool, you fool, known of your crowing, old cock. Don't frown so, don't, don't hollow, nor howl, nor growl nor bow wow wow. Good Lord, John, how you do look. Told you so, you know. But stop rolling your goose of an old pole about so, and go and drown your sorrows in a bowl. Exhausted, 
very naturally, by so stupendous an effort, the great touch and go could attend to nothing farther that night. Firmly, composedly, yet with an air of conscious power, he handed his M's to the devil in waiting, and then, walking leisurely home, retired with ineffable dignity to bed. Meantime, the devil to whom the copy was entrusted ran upstairs to his case in an unutterable hurry and forthwith made a commencement at setting the M's. Up, in the first place, of course, as the opening word was so, he made a plunge into the capital S hole and came out in triumph with a capital S elated by this success. He immediately threw himself upon the little O box with a blindfold impetuosity, but who shall describe his horror when his fingers came up without the anticipated letter in their clutch? Who shall paint his astonishment and rage at perceiving, as he rubbed his knuckles, that he had been only thumping them, to no purpose, against the bottom of an empty box? Not a single little O was in the little O hole, and, Glancing fearfully at the capital O partition, he found that, to his extreme terror, in a precisely similar predicament. Awe-stricken, his first impulse was to rush to the foreman. Sir, said he, gasping for breath, I can't never set up nothing without no O's. What do you mean by that? Growled the foreman, who was in a very ill humor at being kept up so late. Why, sir, there being to know in the office, neither a big un nor a little un. What? What the DL has become of all that were in the case? I don't know, sir, said the boy, but one of them were gazette devils is been prowling bout here all night, and I spect he's gone and cabbaged them every one. Dodi rot him. I haven't a doubt of it, replied the foreman getting purple with rage. But I tell you what you do, Bob. That's a good boy. You go over the first chance you get and hook every one of their eyes and DN them. There isn't. Just so, replied Bob, with a wink and a frown. I'll be into M. I let M know a thing or two. But in the meantime, that air paragraph must go in tonight. You know else there'll be the DL to pay, and, and not a bit of pitch hot, interrupted the foreman, with a deep sigh and an emphasis on the bit. Is it a very long paragraph, Bob? Shouldn't call it a very long paragraph, said Bob. Ah, well, then, do the best you can with it. We must get to press, said the foreman, who was over head and ears in work. Just stick in some other letter for O. Nobody's going to read the fellow's trash, anyhow. Very well, replied Bob. Here goes it. And off he hurried to his case, muttering as he went. Considerable vel, the mere expressions, pert it cluff for a man as doesn't swore. So eyes to gouge out all their eyes, eh? And DN all their gizzards. Vel. This here's the chap as is just able for to do it. The fact is, that although Bob was but twelve years old and four feet high, he was equal to any amount of fight, in a small way. The exigency here described is by no means of rare occurrence in printing offices, and I cannot tell how to account for it, but the fact is indisputable, that when the exigency does occur, it almost always happens that X is adopted as a substitute for the letter deficient. The true reason, perhaps, is that X is rather the most superabundant letter in the cases, or at least was so in the old times, long enough to render the substitution in question an habitual thing with printers. As for Bob, he would have considered it heretical to employ any other character, in a case of this kind, than the X to which he had been accustomed. I shall have to X this air paragraph, said he to himself, as he read it over in astonishment, 
but it's just about the awfulest Toui paragraph I ever did see. So exit he did, unflinchingly, and to press it went exit. Next morning, the population of Nopolis were taken all aback by reading, in the teapot, the following extraordinary leader. So ho, John, how now? Told you so, you know. Don't crow, another time, before you're out of the woods. Does your mother know you're out? Oh no, no, so go home at once, now, John, to your odious old woods of Concord. Go home to your woods, old Dowl. Go. You won't. Oh, po, po, John, don't do so. You've got to go, you know. So go at once and don't go slow. For nobody owns you here, you know. Oh, John, John, if you don't go, you're no homo, no. You're only a fowl, an owl, a cow, a sow. A doll, a pole, a poor old good for nothing to nobody log, dog, hog, or frog, come out of a conquered bog. Cool, now cool, do be cool, you fool. Known of your crowing, old cock. Don't frown so, don't, don't hollow, nor howl, nor growl, nor bow wow wow. Good Lord, John, how you do look. Told you so, you know. But stop rolling your goose of an old pole about so, and go and drown your sorrows in a bowl. The uproar occasioned by this mystical and cabalistical article is not to be conceived. The first definite idea entertained by the populace was that some diabolical treason lay concealed in the hieroglyphics, and there was a general rush to Bullet Head's residence for the purpose of riding him on a rail. But that gentleman was nowhere to be found. He had vanished, no one could tell how. And not even the ghost of him has ever been seen since. Unable to discover its legitimate object, the popular fury at length subsided. Leaving behind it, by way of sediment, quite a medley of opinion about this unhappy affair. One gentleman thought the whole an excellent joke. Another said that, indeed, Bullet Head had shown much exuberance of fancy. A third admitted him eccentric, but no more. A fourth could only suppose it the Yankees designed to express, in a general way, his exasperation. Say, rather, to set an example to posterity, suggested a fifth. That bullet head had been driven to an extremity was clear to all. And in fact, since that editor could not be found, there was some talk about lynching the other one. The more common conclusion, however, was that the affair was, simply, extraordinary and inexplicable. Even the town mathematician confessed that he could make nothing of so dark a problem. X everybody knew, was an unknown quantity. But in this case, as he properly observed, there was an unknown quantity of X, the opinion of Bob, the devil who kept dark about his having X said the paragraph, did not meet with so much attention as I think it deserved, although it was very openly and very fearlessly expressed. He said that, for his part, he had no doubt about the matter at all that it was a clear case, that Mr. Bullethead never could be persuaded fur to drink like other folks, but was continually a svigging o that air blessed xxx exhale, and, as a natural consequence, it just puffed him up savage, and made him ex-cross in the extreme.